So before we get in, I know you guys realize that uh, we have a lot of people that watch these uh, Bible studies online on our videos and in our, listen to them in our podcast. So I want to make just a couple of quick remarks before we dive into the content primarily for that uh, group. You know, like a lot of conservative Christian Bible teaching uh, pastors and Bible teachers, uh, not by works, our ministry, uh, is, is really being censored a lot. It's being uh, shadow banned, and I got an email yesterday from someone looking for one of our videos that they had heard me talk about somewhere in some venue, and they couldn't find it. So I was able to point them to our website, and uh, I just wanted to mention that our website is our main platform. Uh, because we control it, right? It's the one place that, that this big tech censorship can't really touch, at least for now. Of course, they could shut down the whole internet, I realize that, but unlike the social media sites and uh, other uh, groups that like to label conservatives and you know put warnings on their sites and even take down their videos, as we've had happen, uh, that's not the case with notbyworks.org. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, you know, if you're looking for something from this ministry, go to notbyworks.org. Bookmark it. Let that be kind of your central place. Um, uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. Our main menu, you know, links you to articles and podcasts and videos by title. Uh, if you're looking for the Spirit of the Antichrist or this series that we're doing right now, What Lies Ahead, or that Culture Shock series that we're doing, which is just little 8 to 10 minute uh, videos that come out once or twice a week. It's all right there at notbyworks.org. We also have an extremely important link on the main menu there called COVID data that links you to some accurate scientific data about COVID that you won't hear in the mainstream uh, media. Uh, so, And you can watch the videos right there on the website. That's the key thing. You can watch them on YouTube. You can watch them on Rumble, and that's certainly fine if you want to do that. Uh, but uh, get in the habit of going straight to uh, notbyworks.org, and there, there you're going to find all kinds of uh, data. And then speaking of that, you'll also find our online store right there. And this series that we're going through right now, <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about the revived Roman Empire, which is funny because I got an email this morning on my drive-in from someone just through the contact page on our website saying, hey, what do you think about the revived Roman Empire? What do you think it is? And I, So I can't wait to get home today and I'll email them back and say, well, Watch, Watch this video, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, it, the books are at the back here on the table. For those of you that are here in person, if you're watching this online or listening to the podcast and you'd like the book, we have a book called What Lies Ahead, A Biblical Overview of the End Times, which is a comprehensive 350-page uh, uh, book covering everything that we're going to be covering uh, in this series. And if you use the, the coupon code WLA, then you'll get the 25% uh, off. So just by way of review... Uh, we've uh, talked about, you know, from going way back, how prophecy begins in Genesis. It doesn't begin in Revelation. It begins with God's plan of the ages, when he spoke the world into existence and put a plan together, a plan that involved us having free will. We rebelled against our Creator and fell, bringing corruption and sin into, into the world. And then God's plan of the ages is, about, is all about redemption and about redeeming not only individual human beings, but all of creation from the curse of sin. And that involves a promise of a coming kingdom, a covenant to guarantee that promise. It involves a, a plan for various groups. He's got a plan for angels, for demons, for animals, for plants, for people, for the church, for Israel. Uh, and if you don't see a distinction between those different programs and plans and what God's doing, uh, you're going to end up at an inaccurate understanding of God's plan. Uh, then we talked about the rapture, spent several weeks on that, and then we moved into uh, the book of Daniel. And so that's where we find ourselves today, is Daniel's explosive uh, prophecies. And I introduced it last week, so I won't take a whole lot of time, except to say that we're leading up to this seven-year period uh, that the Bible calls the Tribulation. And it's also spoken of in the book of Daniel as the 70th week of Daniel. And so we've got a couple of more weeks before we get to that passage in chapter 9 of Daniel in earnest, but I hope you'll stick with me because that's kind of the climactic prophecy really in all of Scripture. It's the key to understanding uh, God's end times prophecy because it's a 490-year plan where the Bible explicitly tells us when it starts to the day, we know on the calendar when that started, and when it will end. And so using that prophecy 
and overlaying it with human history, we can really uh, see a lot about how God is working out his plan. So that's the chart that we've been using a lot uh, in this uh, series, and we'll come back to it again and again. Uh, you see the rapture listed there on the far left. It puts an end to the church age. We've talked about the imminency of the rapture. We talked about how it rescues us from this great day of the Lord's wrath. You see one of the labels there for that seven-year period that's highlighted in yellow is the day of the Lord's wrath from Zephaniah. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble by the prophet Jeremiah, meaning that it's all about Israel. It's a focus, once again, on the nation of Israel. Jerusalem takes center stage. The Antichrist is, uh, sets himself up to uh, reign as the ruler of the world in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, the, the satanic temple, not the ultimate temple that Christ will inhabit when he comes back, which is described in uh, the book of Ezekiel, uh, but the, the temporary uh, temple that is rebuilt. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's 144,000 Jewish witnesses that become, initially anyway, God's envoys to spread the gospel of the kingdom throughout the earth in those seven years. As people come to faith, those who were left behind at the rapture and then come to faith in Christ get saved, and many of them will be martyred. Those that aren't will join the missionary endeavors and begin spreading the good news themselves, so that by the time of the second coming, you see it on the right edge of the what's highlighted in yellow there, uh, Christ... Uh, comes back, and there's a whole group of believers who have survived that seven-year period and will then inhabit the kingdom when he inaugurates the kingdom a short time later. So by way of introduction in Daniel, we talked here about uh, th that it's you know taking place about five, six hundred years before Christ. Um, it deals with God's program for the world and then specifically God's program uh, for Israel. And so we put this chart uh, out there, and uh, we won't take the time to go through it again. I've had several people email me this week uh, for copies of that. If you'd like a copy of it, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, but uh, it's, it's helpful to kind of see every book when you're studying it in its broader context rather than just pulling one passage out of context. So we're looking primarily at chapters 2, 7, and 9, and kind of leading up to 9, which is really the pivotal event. But Daniel is a remarkable prophecy. So much of it has been fulfilled precisely as Daniel predicted it would be. And, and that means we can count on the parts that haven't been fulfilled being fulfilled the same way. That's comforting. Remember, one of the reasons we study Bible prophecy is to be reminded that we serve a covenant-keeping God who is, in fact, trustworthy. And so that leads uh, to kind of the question at hand, which is, can a God be trusted. After 70 years of captivity uh, in Daniel's day, Jeremiah, remember the prophet, had predicted 70 years of captivity. Uh, you know, is God, has he forsaken Israel? Is he going to leave them in captivity? Or is there going to be a future time when they are regathered into the promised land the way they were uh, told they would and the way God promised they would and, and have an incredible kingdom of perfect peace and righteousness and justice? When the Son of David, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ himself, sits on the throne and rules with a rod of iron? And the answer is an, an overwhelming yes, and Daniel helps us uh, remember that. So in terms of uh, God's plan of the ages, if you just look at it in linear time, you can see that throughout time God has had a different way of interacting with mankind. Uh, these are sometimes called dispensations or economies or stewardships, um, and again, it's not uh, the Bible doesn't necessarily clearly have a line of demarcation between these, but as you look at human history through the lens of Scripture, you see, for example, that clearly God interacted with Adam and Eve a little differently than he did with, say, Noah or, say, Abraham or the Old Testament saints in the time of Israel under the Mosaic Law, and certainly a little bit differently than he does today. And so we're living right now in what the Bible calls the last days, because this is the last era according to biblical history prior to the coming of the kingdom the only thing left to happen is the fulfillment the consummation the inauguration of the the, the, the long-awaited messianic kingdom remember we've talked a lot about how one-sixth of the bible represents unfulfilled prophecy so that's a lot that's 16 percent and a lot of churches today are what i call part of the 84 percent club 
They don't preach Bible prophecy, so they're only preaching 84% of the Bible. And that's a problem for me because I want to preach the whole counsel of God, and God revealed it all to us, so why wouldn't we want to study and understand and apply all of it uh, to our lives? And so the question again is, can God be trusted? And uh, we're going to answer that question with a resounding uh, yes. So uh, as we kind of get in kick it into gear here and take a look at Daniel chapter 2. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we're just going to walk through it verse by verse. But I wanted to mention a couple of other passages. In, in Luke 21, Jesus reminds us that Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. What are the times of the Gentiles? It's very similar to what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 11. When he said, I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, talking about the present church age, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, different nuances there. Paul is speaking of it in terms of sort of the harvest of souls, whereas Jesus was talking here about a time period. But the fact of the matter is, as Daniel is going to explain, that God has foreordained that for a period of time, the nation of Israel would be under Gentile domination, just as it is today. That's one of the things we need to remember, that, that the Jews are not in the land of Israel today, as exciting as that was on May 15, 1948, when they became a nation once again. They're not there in belief. They're not there in fulfillment of scripture where for example in Matthew 24 the Bible tells us that when Christ comes back at the second coming he's going to send his angels to the four corners of the earth to regather Israel it's a supernatural regathering and it's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies like Deuteronomy 30 verse 3 and Isaiah 27 I think it's verse 13 so that has not happened yet this is a setting of the stage but the, the leadership in Israel today is not necessarily believers. That doesn't mean that some of them haven't trusted in Jesus Christ as the Savior and the only one who can forgive sin. That doesn't mean some of them aren't born again. They are. But as a whole, the leaders are no better off today than they were in the first century when the Jewish leaders nationally rejected Christ, right? So we need to understand that, that we are still under the times of the Gentiles. And the times of the Gentiles are not exactly corresponding to the church age. If we go back here to uh, this chart, uh, the church age, remember, was everything from the day of Pentecost. It's kind of, it's not drawn to scale here, so you just see a small section there on the far left that says church. But the church age is the present age in which we live. In fact, maybe this would be a better uh, chart to examine. But the church age, represented there by number six, is not the same thing as the times of the Gentiles. Why? Well, because the times of the Gentiles began way back in Daniel's day when Israel was carted off into captivity, uh, and it will continue all the way through to the end of the tribulation. So that, that, that red inset that you see there called the tribulation or the wrath of God, that seven-year period that we've talked about that we're going to get to in earnest here in a couple of sessions. So that's the times of the Gentiles. Until Jesus Christ the Messiah comes back and throws off the shackles of the revived Roman Empire, takes the throne, and rules over the kingdom as described so beautifully in so much of the Old Testament, uh, the, the nation of Israel will be living under uh, the times of the Gentiles. And, so, um, and then what Paul is saying is that until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then Israel is going to be sort of not center stage. Now, we don't have it on the screen, but the very next uh, passage, the very next verse here in Romans chapter 11, verse 26, talks about how until the deliverer, Jesus Christ, comes back to Zion and sets up the kingdom. And Paul quotes uh, from uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and some Old Testament kingdom passages. So this is the age in which we are living. This is the age that Daniel is going to be uh, talking about. And we might wonder why. Why is God allowing this Gentile domination of Israel for so long? I mean, why not just end it all? Why not bring Israel back from captivity? Why not regather them supernaturally, like the Bible describes, into the land? You know, remember uh, Jesus told the first century Jewish leaders, uh, 
uh, on Wednesday, the day before he was betrayed on Thursday in the garden, he said, you're not going to see me again. You know, your house is left to you desolate. You'll never see me again until you cry, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Quoting that Messianic Psalm 118 uh, and, 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 and saying that, that that's when he's going to come back. Israel has to believe before they can be given the kingdom. And Paul makes that very clear in Romans chapter 10. He says, how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? Right? They've got to believe first. Individual faith must come before national confession and national calling on the name of the Lord. And so he says, you're not going to see me again until you do that. And then earlier that week, that was on Wednesday of Passion Week, remember, there had been a remnant, a small splattering of believers who had cried, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But very quickly, those cries turned to the mobs shouting, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, right? And so Jesus is saying, next time, it's going to be the opposite. Next time, after the tribulation, after the outpouring of God's wrath, the nation of Israel will, in fact, respond favorably to the king. They will believe the gospel message, and Jesus will supernaturally, at his second coming, regather them and deposit them physically, geographically, once again in the long-awaited kingdom. But we might ask, why doesn't he just go ahead and do that now? And I think uh, 2 Peter 3.9 helps us understand maybe a little bit of God's perspective, where it says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Remember the context here in 2 Peter 3. The context is, boy, as time goes on, many scoffers and mockers are going to come in the latter days, and they're going to say, where is the promise of, the, of his coming? Where is this promise that he said he was going to bring a kingdom? Everything's the same as it's always been. You guys are nuts. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the implication. And, and Peter goes on to say, look, essentially God's got this. It's in his control. He's not slack concerning his promise. In other words, he hasn't forgotten his promise. He's not ignoring it. He's not just brushing it aside. But he is long-suffering. And he's not willing that any should perish. So the long-suffering mercy of our Lord is one reason that he wants uh, people to come to faith. And that's one of the purposes of the church age, remember? We go back to the video we did several sessions ago on the distinction between the church and Israel. And one of our reasons for being here, you and I, Jew and Gentile in one body, the mystery of the church, is to share the gospel. That's the Great Commission. And so we both eagerly wait for his coming, the rapture, which will rescue us before the great day of the Lord's wrath. And yet at the same time, we know that if he delays his coming, well, that just gives us more time to share the good news of salvation through faith alone in Christ alone. All right, so let's dive in here to chapter 2. We're going to look at the statue and the beasts. Today we'll look at the statue, and then next week we'll look at chapter 7 and uh, the beasts. And I want to go verse by verse to kind of set the stage, because it's really a, a fascinating narrative, and it's kind of exciting. It would make a great screenplay, frankly. But let's start with verse 1. Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. You ever been had such a vivid dream, maybe a nightmare, that it literally awakened you with a start? And then you just, you remember it? You know, a lot of times we don't remember our dreams, right? But boy, when you do... If it's one that wakes you up in the middle of the night, it can be hard to get back to sleep. It can be really troubling. And that was the nature of this dream. And so the king gave the command. This is Nebuchadnezzar, of course. The king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, or Babylonians, to tell the king his dreams. Now, interesting that we're going to see this story gets a little strange because he's not wanting only the interpretation, but he wants to, them to tell him what dream that he had. It's unclear from the text whether Nebuchadnezzar literally forgot his dream or whether he, this was a test. My take on it is it seems to be that he couldn't remember all of it, but it's one of those things he would know it if he heard it. So he was like, yeah, yeah, that's it, when, when he had them tell it. So it wasn't like, because if he didn't remember it at all, they could have just made something up, right? But the text indicates, as we're going to see, that these magicians were worried about not being the fact that they couldn't tell him what his dream was. Well, if, if he didn't know what his dream was, they could have just made up anything, and he wouldn't have known, been the wiser. So there seems to be a sense of here, 
in which it's partly a test, but at the same time, he really maybe can't quite remember all of the details. So they came and they stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever, obviously being respectful. Just tell us the dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. Sound good? You can kind of sense they're a little bit nervous and they want to be respectful, but they're like, what do you mean, tell us, the, you, know, t you want us to tell you the dream? You tell us the dream, we'll tell you the interpretation. That's generally the way these things work, you know. Well, the king answered and said to them, nope, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your ashes shall be made an ash heap. Well, that's pretty clear what he's looking for. <laughs> and if you're one of these magicians, you're thinking, oh, no. So, and of course, they're relying on their false gods, their satanic gods, to try to help them. And, of course, the hero of all prophecy, never forget, the hero of all prophecy in Scripture is God. And God is certainly the hero of this prophecy because he comes in and, uh, and, and in fact, gives Daniel the dream, as we shall see. But the king goes on, However, if you tell me the dream and its interpretation, then you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honor. You know, your choice, guys. You can tell me what I dreamed and interpret it for me, and it's going to be a great reward. If you don't do that, it's curtains. That's the idea. So, therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Well, they answered again. Uh, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. <laughs> and once again, the king says, I know for certain that you would gain time. In other words, the Nebuchadnezzar here sees through their attempt to delay. You know, they, they wanted to put distance between the king's dream and their report, because they thought the longer it takes, you know, then maybe he'll forget, or they'll that he won't remember, or what they tell him won't necessarily be contradictory with what's banging around in the recesses of his mind. And um, but uh, he's 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 not going to have it, is he? He says, you know, no, I know what you're trying to do here. You're just trying to stall. Um, so my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you've agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I, and I shall know that you give me its interpretation. Well, they answered and said, King, look, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. In other words, nobody can do what you're asking, King, and that's the reason no one's ever asked for it before. They're getting a little bit snippy here. Um, and, and they go on, it's a difficult thing that the king requests. And notice there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods. Now again, their faith is in the false gods, the pagan ancient Near Eastern gods, uh, but basically, they're recognizing that this is a supernatural matter. This is not something that someone who is in the flesh, dwelling on earth, can do. This needs some special uh, attention. And, uh, of course, this little foreshadowing here of the response of these magicians sets the stage for the one true God to supernaturally come in and do just what they're saying, only a God uh, can do, but it's not any God, it's the, the God, the one true God. So how does King Nebuchadnezzar respond? Well, he says, for this reason, the king was angry and very furious, and he gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Most likely they're referring to the central city of Babylon, not the whole region of Babylon. So the decree goes out, and they begin killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions, to kill them. See, Daniel fell under this king's decree because he was an advisor to the king. He was in the city there, and uh, so he was just being swept up in this uh, decree. 
Notice, then with wise counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, the one who was out delivering the message and rounding up the magicians, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Why, why is it so urgent? And so Arioch made the decision known to Daniel, over to explain what had happened. And then notice, so Daniel went in and asked the king, remember he had an open door policy with the king, he was the king's cupbearer, that he might tell the king the interpretation. And then notice what he does. After he lets his request be made known, Daniel went to his house and made his decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now, who are they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's exactly right. So when they moved, that, this is their Hebrew names. When they got taken captive and moved to Babylon, they were given Aramaic names or Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which is the way we know them. But their Hebrew names, their given names, were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But notice this. I love this next verse. So he goes to his house. He talks to his buddies. And he says, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. Now here's a very interesting fact. You ought to write this down in the margin of your Bible. This is the first recorded example in the Bible. Now think of what we've had. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, all the historical, the Pentateuch, the historical narratives. Most of the prophets, or some of the prophets in the wisdom literature. And then you get to Daniel. And this, this is the first time in the record of Scripture that we have an example of a corporate prayer meeting where more than one person comes together to pray for something. Pretty amazing, isn't it? And it was on the occasion of needing help from persecution. Pretty interesting, especially for the times in which we live. Plenty of men and women of God throughout history had prayed and sought the Lord. And, uh, prayer is, is pervasive throughout the Bible. But not until this example here in Daniel 2 do you see a group of people getting together to pray. Uh, so they came together to pray so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men in uh, Babylon. And so then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. In other words, God answered the prayer. So Daniel then blessed the God of heaven, and it's a beautiful prayer in verses 20 to 23. We're going to just look at the first two verses, but since God had answered his prayer and told him the dream and the interpretation, Daniel says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. And watch this. He removes kings and raises up kings. Now, Daniel, remember, he's praying a prayer of thanksgiving to God for answering his prayer and giving him the desires of his heart. And Dan, the book of Daniel also teaches us, as does the book of Job, that even when God doesn't give us what we want, he's still God, and we should still praise him, because he knows more than we do, and he sees the beginning from the end, and we don't always have the answers. But boy, when we pray for something specific, and God gives us the answer to that prayer, it is a great occasion to praise God, isn't it? And we thank the Lord for that. But it's interesting that in his prayer... Daniel here alludes to something that the dream he's about to interpret is all about, which is the fact that God uh, presides over the kingdoms of men. He puts kings in place and he takes them down. Right? And so he thanks God for, for that, presumably that he had just learned uh, from God revealing the dream to him. He, he thanks God because God gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And he goes on, you can read the rest of the his prayer. But so Daniel then goes to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to, to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said then, thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. And then, I love this, Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king. I mean, yeah, this was an urgent matter. People were dying. It's time to put a stop to this. And he said, I found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. So Nebuchadnezzar uh, says to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel says, The secret which the king has demanded 
the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. So I love his little preamble here. You know, again, God's the hero, and Daniel knows God. Daniel's trusted God. We're going to see him trust God again in chapter 3. And, you know, uh, it's just a theme of the book and a theme of Daniel's life. And it should be characteristic of our lives, too, to trust God in good times and bad. Uh, remember, our study through the book of Hebrews is, is called Trusting God in Trying Times. Um, but before Daniel gets right to the point and begins to explain this dream that becomes so critical for understanding uh, God's plan of the ages, he says, uh, this secret that I'm about to tell you, O King Nebuchadnezzar, I just want to remind you that these astrologers and magicians and pagan soothsayers, they couldn't tell you, but there is a God in heaven who does reveal secrets and who can tell you this dream. And then he made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. The latter days. So again, he's, he's going to outline a series of events or kingdoms that God is going to use during these times of the Gentiles until the consummation of the age when Christ comes back. And he goes on, As for you, O king, thoughts came to to your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets, notice the capital H there in the New King James, God, has made known to you what will be. What will be. Now, so many Bible teachers have you know, talked about this dream in D Daniel chapter 2. Uh, one, Feinberg put it this way, no dream ever recorded or referred to in the Bible before this or since has revealed so much about God's plan for world history. And that's why we're starting here with Daniel chapter 2. So let me sort of give you a rudimentary picture of Daniel's dream of the statue, and then we'll go through and let Daniel uh, interpret it. We're going to skip straight to the interpretation, and not because Daniel tells the dream, then he goes back and interprets the dream, but it's a little bit redundant, but for the sake of time, we'll just go straight to the interpretation. But here's the dream. It's a dream of a statue that has a head of gold, and then a midsection of silver, and then bronze, and then legs of iron. And then he talks about feet, and this is the key, as we shall see, that are a mixture of iron and clay. So that's the, uh, that's the vision. So Daniel says, this is the dream. Now we shall tell the interpretation of it. Again, we're skipping straight to the interpretation. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom. And indeed, he had. Uh, and that's uh, talking about uh, Babylon, the gold. We'll come back to the statue in a moment and kind of fill it in. But basically, the kingdom that, Babel, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar was in right now, he was the king of. God gave it to you, by the way. Don't think you got there by yourself. You know, Somebody puts you there. You know, it's like the proverbial turtle on the fence post. You know, a boy comes along, finds turtle, puts it on the fence post, and a little bit later, the turtle looks around and thinks, man, how did I get up here, right? You know, that's the way kings are. God puts kings. He puts presidents, right? God put, how many of you believe God put Joe Biden in place? You better raise your hand because God is God and God is sovereign, right? Uh, I don't like it, but God didn't ask my opinion, right? And God knows what he's doing. Then he goes on, but after you shall rise another kingdom. <coughs> this is the silver in the statue. <coughs> And this refers to Media Persia, the empire that comes after Babylon. And then he says, and then another kingdom, a third kingdom of bronze will come to be. And this is talking about the Greek empire with Alexander the Great, right? And shall rule over all the earth. And then finally, the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And this is the Roman empire that was still dominant in the time of Christ in the first century that took over for the Greek Empire. That's why we called it the Greco-Roman world, right? But notice, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, this kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. It was the most dominant empire to that day, the Roman Empire, right? And then he talks about the feet. Notice he says... Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. What kingdom? The Roman kingdom, the Roman Empire. This is not a fifth kingdom. 
And even though it's gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then iron and clay, five components, he's not introducing here a fifth kingdom. And the text doesn't say that. It just says the kingdom that I just talked about, the one of iron, the Roman Empire, is going to be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. So again, if we go back here, we've got gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then iron mixed with clay. And if you put this into a historical calendar, it would look something like this with uh, the Babylonian Empire, which happened in 605 B.C., or, or came into being in 605 B.C., uh, with the downfall of the Assyrian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire uh, with the destruction of Jerusalem, and then the Greek Empire began in 330 B.C., and then the Roman Empire, of course, in 27 B.C., and then this final empire is the revived Roman Empire that Daniel is going to talk so much about, and that's going to become clear in later chapters of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation and other uh, uh, prophetic passages of Scripture. So if you think about this Roman Empire, out of it someday is going to be a revival of this uh, original Roman Empire. And just as the original Roman Empire was made up of two parts, the western half with Rome and the eastern half with Constantinople, similarly, I take it that the revived Roman Empire is going to have two parts. We don't know exactly what it will be made up of, but it talks about a ten-nation confederacy. Perhaps it's going to be five nations uh, from the West in what is today Europe, uh, and five nations from uh, the East in what is today Eastern Europe. We don't know. It would be speculation, and it's beyond the scope of Scripture. All we know that it's going to be geographically a revived a revival of the Roman Empire, and if, say, for example, the rapture were to happen today and then we were to shift into the tribulation period, then it might include nations like France or Spain or England and, you know, some of the Eastern European uh, nations. We don't know. The, the map is constantly changing, right? Nations come and go. Nations get absorbed into other nations. They change names. They break away from other nations. So, so who knows? But certainly it's going to be a, uh, a revival of this Roman Empire. So let's see what Daniel says about the strength and power of this future end times empire. He says, Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron, we just looked at this, shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. So what he's showing here is that in the comparison to these other kingdoms that he's just outlined in world history, and by the way, they all happened just like Daniel's prophecy said they would, uh, that this revival of the Roman Empire is going to be very fragile. And indeed it will, because how long is it going to last? Seven years. Seven years from the time that the little horn, as is Daniel's name for the Antichrist, takes charge of this revived Roman Empire until Christ comes back, as Daniel's about to explain, and destroys it. So it's fragile, it's short-lived, it's powerful, it's got the iron in it, just like the original Roman Empire, but it is, it is fragile as well, and it's sort of the, uh, this final climactic struggle between God and Satan that reaches... It's, it's unprecedented heights in that final seven-year period. So Daniel goes on, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. And so how does that happen? Well, going, this is kind of going back just because it's a better description to when Daniel is first telling the dream, and then he explains it. But he's telling Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and he says, You watched, King Nebuchadnezzar, while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on its feet, that iron clay mixture, the revived Roman Empire, and broke them into pieces. So that's what happens to this future revived Roman Empire. It is utterly destroyed. Now, who is this stone not made with hands? 
Jesus Christ. Later, Daniel is going to describe him as one like the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he comes back and destroys that fragile, revived Roman Empire, uh, then God is going to, again, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And, and uh, it will last forever and ever. And this is exactly what God's promise. Remember we talked about the covenant promise that undergirds and guarantees the kingdom that, that was going all the way back to Genesis 3.15 that was promised? Well, that's what that original covenant said with, Dave, with uh, David in 2 Samuel 7.16. Your house and your kingdom and your throne shall be established forever. And in fact, every reference we see to this future earthly kingdom of Christ, the Messiah, the Messianic kingdom, speaks of it as an eternal kingdom, unlike these other kingdoms, you know. Uh, the, the Babylonian Empire, as Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to last forever. Guess what? Another earthly kingdom is going to come and knock you out. And then Greek, Greece is going to come and knock out the Media Persian Empire. And then Rome's going to come and knock out Greece. And then the Roman Empire is going to be revived. And there's so much we could say about that. We'll get to it in this series down the road. But it involves a rebuilt Babylon, it involves a religious harlot, it involves a, a, a political system, an economic system. Uh, it's a one world system led by uh, the Antichrist and emanating from this revived uh, Roman Empire. But it's going to be short-lived because the eternal kingdom, the messianic kingdom of Christ, is going to come back and destroy it once and for all. So if you go back to Luke chapter one, behold, you will conceive in your room, this is Gabriel talking to Mary, and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, just like we read in 2 Samuel seven sixteen, And he will reign over the house of Jacob, what? Forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. We see it in the prophecies of, of Isaiah. We think of these in terms of uh, Christmas, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. But notice the government will be upon his shoulder. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So uh, we're going to come back next week and kind of compare Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue with Daniel's bizarre dream of these beasts, right? This vision of these beasts. And we're going to see how they kind of correlate with uh, one another. But any questions uh, before we close out uh, today? Any comments or questions about the revived Roman Empire? Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you. We will stop there and then.